Louise Hawley and her husband Jack, both of them deeply committed Sai Baba followers for the last half a century. And today, at the age of 90, Jack moves forward, having recently lost Wheeze following a long illness. And one of Jack's final questions to Louise? Where are you now? She said, uh, I am there. And I immediately could see her there, there with Swami. But when he turns into you being your guru, which he was my guru, and uh, one day, I love this story. He, he stopped my wife and I, and he, uh, he, with a big smile on his face, he says, higher vibrations now. We didn't know what that meant, but we know that somehow we had graduated from someplace and we're <laughs> going someplace else. Jack and Louise have heard Sai Baba's only mantra he gives out. He says to repeat after me, I am God, I am God. I am no different from God. Sai Baba talks over and over again about oneness with God. And uh, little beams of light are shining through that for myself, as they have already shined through for Louise. For Jack Hawley, modesty becomes him. You asked me a question that brought this answer up is, you said, well, now that you've graduated, what, what are you going to do? And uh, the answer that I received inside was, there is more, a thousand steps more. And my final question to Jack, after so much time with Sai Baba, every year in India for six months, what have you learned? If I were to say 50 years almost with Baba in your hip pocket, the top three lessons or experiences you had, would you be able to take a stab at that? I'm just dumb enough to try. <laughs> He's a man of many strengths, many skills, and many friends, and many faces, ever devoted to his wife, Louise. This is their story. Welcome to Sojourns. This interview was recorded on February 18th, 2023, in Palm Springs, California. Jack Hawley, I think you're 78 or 79 by now? Uh, a little bit older. That was when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you now? I'm 90. Actually, I'm in my 91st year, according to, the, to India. We begin our story, sadly, with the end. The end of Jack's beloved wife's worldly existence. Louise Hawley was 88. All of us who know you and love you continually express our condolences Louise, Wheezy, as you always called her, great side devotee, loving woman, great partner, great wife, and she's with Baba. What's that like, do you think? She is with not Baba. only she is part of Baba, and Baba is part of her. And I keep getting messages or indications from them as one. Here in beautiful Palm Springs, California, are you coping okay? Are you doing okay? Uh, I had very little coping to do. And again, about Swami, uh, his comment I've heard so many times and I, and I wondered how that would work. And his comment was something about uh, no grief. There is no need for grief. And my answer to that is uh, that, that he's, he's presented that to me and Weez was with him and there is no grief. I know you've been working on some papers here that I'd like you to talk about because you said this is the work that you've been doing contained in this book here for some time now. What are you writing now? What kind of a journal are you keeping? I'm, I'm keeping a, a journal since Louise's death. I'm keeping a journal uh, so that I can remember it, so that now at my 90 years old, I can uh, not forget it. So uh, this morning, what I did before you came is thinking of you and thinking we're going to go out for lunch and that's going to be it. That's going to be it. But now here I am, you've got me working. So, <laughs> so, so today there is not going to be any heavy lifting. Say hello to Ted and let's go have some lunch. That was going to be the... That was, that was my, my perception of it, yeah. But uh, 
I really did uh, pull some notes together so that it would be fresh in my mind. And I learned all morning long. I've been wonderfully learning. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I forgot that. Oh, yes. So it's been very nice for me. Well, you're my teacher for me because I'm not, well, I am far behind you, but not that far behind you at 77. I'm finding it to be very convenient to have a pencil in hand with a piece of paper have handy to to, jo to to really jot things down when I need to remember them. I find that if I don't do it, it flies away. <laughs> it flies away. <laughs> Well, do you want to give us a highlight of what's in this, or do you want to um, keep, is it too personal? No, it's not too personal. I'd, I'd like to share every bit of it, but it would take 17 hours. Well, I got 15 hours, so start <laughs> shooting. No, what I think uh, one of the things that I would like to say is uh, tell the story of uh, Weez's last words. You know, and she was, she was in a hospice bed here at home for uh, 13 months. About two weeks before uh, she left, I was start. I and this is, I love saying this because it shows how dumb I can be. <laughs> I uh, I started to worry about whether she was uh, suffering to the point where she would be forgetting Baba. So I, I reached over one uh, to whisper to her. And by the way, there's a, a caregiver in the room there. So I would whisper to her, I said, I wanted to, I wanted to check to see if she had Swami on her mind. So mm -hmm. I said, are you with Swami? She hadn't been able to speak for maybe a month. And it was all uh, uh, a, a very uh, muddled kind of speech. So you weren't really expecting her to answer your uh, question? That's maybe? right. She, uh, I, I wasn't, well, this is what I wanted to find. I wanted to put something in her mind and I put that in her mind is, are you with Swami? And uh, not having said a word for maybe two weeks, she she came out with yes, was as clear and as strong uh, as as a word could be. It was as if she had not been in hospice for that long. She heard the question, she understood That's the right. question, and, and she immediately, very well answered it. This, with two S's, yes. At an at a exclamation point. How did that make you feel? Uh, two ways. One is I was delighted, and I was so happy to hear that. And the second one is I was uh, uh, questioning myself for even questioning her. Because I, you know, we, uh, oh, she wrote, if you remember, and uh, yeah, you do remember, uh, and Jody remembers especially, she wrote a nice article for uh, the uh, Sai Baba organization in Singapore. It was called Being Divine Love. And that article served several purposes. During that, those uh, 12 months, let's say, by that time, of her in hospice, uh, slowly, gradually declining day after day, I would read that to her. I would read it, I, I read it maybe uh, over those months, maybe uh, 20 times. And each time I read it, I would learn more. And it was uh, this wonderful uh, commentary of hers about how uh, uh, how she, she doesn't want to make a big thing out of it. She doesn't want to make anything complicated uh, about love, but she wants to be that. She just wants to be it. Not to think about it, not to read about it, not to practice it, not to... Uh, not to understand it, that's right, not, not to not know to, it. That was a, the to key. To be it. The key. She just wanted to be that. And, uh, and it was wonderful. Oh. And every time I read that to her, she would, uh, she would nod. She would, uh, even so at the, in the earliest phases, she would talk to me about it and so forth. And uh, the, the, the daytime caregiver for her because uh, she was totally bed-bound, by the way, for that year. So the daytime, so we had caregivers day and night. The daytime caregiver would listen, and she would take in so much, a wonderful little uh, uh, American-Mexican lady, and, uh, and learn so much. So then, uh, so that was, let's say, 10 days before her passing. Uh, and then the day of her passing, or it might have been the night before, but I think the day of her passing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I leaned over again with a very uh, 
meeker, more meek uh, question. I said, uh, where are you now? Because I wanted to see if there's been any change since that 10 days ago. And again, the first, these are the first words she spoke in that, those 10 days maybe. No, she, they're the third words. But she said, uh, I am there. Oh. I know. And, and I immediately could see her there. I couldn't see it visually, but I could, I could just feel and see and visualize and have a vision of her there with Swami. As, of course, before, and as, of course, all of us are always. Well, you're giving me the greatest gift to tell me the story that you just did when she said to your question, mm -hmm. I am there. I am there. And I see that you take meticulous notes with everything that's gone on for a long time now <laughs> between the two of you. And only Jack would do it so well because of your wonderful background. And I should remind people who are probably new to Baba or don't recall your story because it's been many years. I'm going to just guess it's been 45, 50 years since you've been followers of Sai yes, Baba. I think 46, 47. Okay. And over 30 years that you'd go back and forth every six months or so from Los Angeles to Prashanti Nilium, yeah. living at his feet, living beside yes. him, living with him. Mm -hmm. And for six months a year, he got to know you as if he didn't oh, already know you. Wonderful. You were filled with <laughs> laughter and questions and sought his guidance to write one of the best books about the Gita. A walk through for Western. A walk through. And when I uh, showed Baba the, 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 the final, showed Swami the final, he looked at it and he, and he wrinkled his brow. He said, for Westerners? <laughs> Meaning, why not for everybody? That's right. And since then, I've, I've got a lot of feedback from India saying the same thing. They say, oh, yes, my father has never touched the Gita, and now he's read it and he loves it. And, and this and is because it's for Westerners. <laughs> Actually, Jack's book is famous around the world. Note this one of many similar reviews. This translation of the epic mystical poem uses everyday prose to walk the reader through difficult concepts. Jack Hawley's Gita is not an abstract classic, but a universal love song that covers a wide range of topics from healing inner pain to celebrating life. And Baba taught you many, many lessons, countless oh. lessons while you were there. And I'm going to suggest to people who would like to know a fuller story of your background to watch the other Sojourns video interview. Heck, we recorded that probably 13, 14, 15 years ago in Prashanti with you uh, oh, when we were visiting uh, the, the first there. one? First yeah, one? the first interview, yeah. <clears throat> More like 20. More like 20 maybe years even ago. 25. Yeah. When, when you explain, and you don't have to go into detail now, some pretty strong stories he, he gave you to mull over, such as, you're with me, you're with the form, you're in my house, you're visiting after dinner on a regular basis. Whoops! One day that's gone. And it, I know it caused consternation for the two of you, but you figured it all out and put it together. Quickly. Quickly. I know. It was it was gone, <laughs> and it was a blessing. And we knew. <laughs> How is it a blessing? Uh, I think it's uh, we, it felt like a, a little graduation ceremony, if you will. I want to ask a question. Interviewing you reminds me of interviewing another woman devotee, but you could have been her son by comparison. Well, almost. No, you could have been. Well, this woman I'm thinking about died at 102, Phyllis Crystal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You know of. I know her, yes. And the surprise of my life in a manner of speaking, she said this story. The last time she saw he saw Baba... Baba said to her, Phyllis, repeat after me, I am God. And she demurred. She refused. She begged off for about five minutes, she says, until he insisted. And I said, Phyllis, why did you, why did you not answer the question? She said, because I don't know that I can say that, being raised a solid Anglican in the Church of England, and, <laughs> and have people understand what that means. Mm. 
You don't have that. Sounds to me like you live your life knowing what Baba means when he says, repeat after me, I am God. What does that mean to you? Uh, that's what I see. I am God. I am that. That I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. And for those who are completely uninformed, what does that mean? It's, it's, it really means the, that oneness is what we all are. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. Yeah. That obviously brings you a great deal of comfort. Yeah. In your oh. senior years at 90. That's what that's what took away the grief. Yeah. That just erased any uh, smidgen of grief that, that would be caused by that because we knew that. So that, miss, that must be what it means when I do, because I'm a reporter for Baba, <laughs> I meet people now, even at Baba's ashram. Sanjay Mahalingam is a professor in his university who is there, who is awakened to the truth of his own identity and in his interview with me, he told me Baba instructed him to throw away all spiritual books. There's nothing more that he needs mm -hmm. okay. because his fear has left him. So that happened to you, being so close to Baba. It sounds like your fear left you many years ago. I first heard of the story of how Jack lost nearly all of his fear more than 21 years ago when I interviewed him at Baba's ashram in Puttaparthi, India in 2002. Are you fearful today? Uh, very little. You somebody, afraid of dying? In the early days coming here to Swami, that's the way I used to describe it. People would say, well, what, what is so important about that place? And at one point I, I just breathed a sigh and said, well, there's no fear left in me. Mm -hmm. And that's very surprising for them. You afraid and, uh, of dying? No, not a bit. Afraid of losing a loved one? Not a bit. Afraid of losing all that you have? Uh, it never comes into my mind. Afraid of nuclear war? N really, not an iota. Not a See, bit. that's uh, quite remarkable. People would think that you're, you found something, but it's probably a chemical. <laughs> and it is. It's probably an internally developed chemical. <laughs> so Overall, your experiences have been lessons learned and lessons that remain with you. Because at 90, you still, you still know, you probably know much more about who you are than you ever did when you were yes. 60 or yes. 50. That's right. <laughs> How or 89. Or 89. How does it work when you go to tell somebody young or a friend or your adult children the essence of what Baba has given you? Does that probably go over a lot of people's it heads? Goes, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I've learned uh, not to really talk an awful lot about it. Yeah. But it has an impact on me not being able to talk about it. And talking with you, for example, right now is, is really very nice for me. It's, a, it's like a little gift. Thank you, Swami. Oh, it's a gift for me, too. Okay. It's, it's the greatest gift Baba's ever given me, I think, in that he's given me multiple opportunities to talk about these very mm, I know. most important lessons of life with others. Mm -hmm. And I can see them light up when they have a chance to explain more about it, too. So uh, the impossible questions to ask you would be if I were to say 50 years almost with Baba in your hip pocket, the top three lessons or experiences you had, would you be able to take a stab at that? I'm just dumb enough to try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one is uh, love, mm. of course. And, and I already talked about... Uh, uh, reading that wonderful paper and, and pussy put it into a, an appropriate place for me. Yeah. Uh, and experiencing it. Experiencing it. And experiencing it, especially with Swami. Uh, that's one. Uh, another would be uh, the idea of uh, there's no end. There's, there's no end. It's just there. 
Um, I think it was you, I'm not sure. Uh, some years ago, when I was talking about a book that I was reading that had, had a focus on uh, consciousness. And, uh, okay, yeah, and there, there, according to that book, there are 17 levels of consciousness. Right. So I had fun with that. And especially because 17 has been sort of a byword for uh, Louise and I. We lived in several houses that had 17 in the number okay. and so forth. So, so that was fun to, to mm -hmm. listen to that. A little Leela on Baba's part, probably. That's right. A well, gift, yes. a divine prank. Right, yes. <laughs> and then, uh, oh yeah, you, I think, asked me, well, uh, when you reach a, a certain level, how many more levels are there above it? <laughs> and my answer quickly from Swami was a thousand. Well, you have to refresh my memory. I thought there were no more levels above it. Yeah, oh, that's what I thought too. <laughs> Thank you, that's right. I thought that We're going to be here all day. A thousand <laughs> levels. <laughs> Just take my word for it. <laughs> in, in a, in a, in, in a, that's, that's really the truth. The truth is this, that we're always learning. And even when we become that, we're always learning. Yeah. Always. I often thought, I mean, I never studied as a student, and I got C's and D's to show you for it. But somewhere in my late teens, early 20s, I awakened to be curious about things, and I terribly mm -hmm. regretted being such a lousy student. But now I think just the opposite, that we're students until yes. the last breath. And we're students beyond the last a breath. A thousand more levels. <laughs> wow. A thousand more levels well, always. That's exciting. I know it, isn't it? <laughs> and especially when you are that. When you, when you, like Louise's paper said, being love. Well, this is being God. Yeah. Wow. Well, I want to pick up on that because you said lesson number one was love. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between knowing what love is and being love or experiencing it. What is that difference? It's almost impossible to say. I think that difference is love. I think it's, there's, it's such a powerful thing to be and to have or to experience or to have granted to you or to b bump up against yeah. it or somehow uh, have in one's life. Well, we're both getting hungry for lunch. <laughs> and I have one question I want to ask you yet. For the benefit of those, who knows who sees these Sojourns interviews? I just put it up to YouTube. It costs me nothing to do. It's a free service. Wonderful. And I get letters from people around the world. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how that works, but uh, I know people are going to want to know more. And my question to you, Jack Hawley, in your 90th year, what might you say to another person who doesn't have what you have about how they might acquire it without having to live all the years that you've lived acquiring it? Um, I have no idea. The, uh, to, uh, there's three ways. I was just uh, remembering a couple of days ago. There are three ways to uh, look at this. One of them would be that there are people who are suddenly touched by it. And we've all heard those great stories. Yes. Suddenly, uh, Ramana Maharshi, at age, what, 15 or 14? 15, 16. 16. Yeah. At age 16, he was that for the now rest of his life. There, and then there are others who, until their 90th year, are sweating it out, and yeah. working at it, and learning every day more and more and more about it. And, uh, uh, and, and then there are... Uh, People who just uh, drop away, they, they, they leave the game, and, uh, and it's, it could be in the first quarter or, or, <laughs> right. or the final few minutes. And you left out one category, especially interesting now, because in this day and age, there are more and more people. I don't want to use this word; it sounds disparaging, but I can't think of a synonym for godless. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in a spiritual idea of where they come from and seem not to be interested. How can people turn on that curiosity to orient them towards understanding not who they think they are, but who they really are? Well, that's the key. And that, that and that's, again, what can take us a, a whole lifetime or can take us a, a brief flash 
from wherever that is. Uh, th th that's the key. <clears throat> uh, and I, I hate to say it, but my imagination now tells me that it, those people just come back. They just mm -hmm. keep coming back over and over again. Which may, may not be a bad thing necessarily. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. Everybody eventually that's gets right. to listen. That's, that's the intention. Yeah. Or that the, the concept is that everybody's going to get there sooner or later. Yeah. You know, it might be a hundred years or a hundred lifetimes yeah. from now, or it might be uh, now. Jack Hawley, the most important question for the end. Where are we going for lunch? <laughs> We're going to a place that reminds me of Cleveland. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, it's a nice place. It's a it's a it's a <laughs> nice restaurant with a, sort of like an eastern tinge to it. <laughs> okay. And, and any last thought or comment that you'd like to bestow upon people from the person you're looking at to your own relatives, your own children and grandchildren, and presumably great grandchildren and friends in general who know you and love you around the world as a Sai Baba devotee. Any last thoughts? Uh, a thousand, but I'll, I'll save some for a little bit as for after we eat. Okay. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Thanks. Jack certainly did have more to say after lunch and we'll get to that soon. But first a little more about Louise, whom we also interviewed here on Soul Journeys. Sai Baba devotee Louise Hawley and her husband Jack live half of each year in California, the other half at Sai Baba's ashram in India. This is Louise's story of her life's spiritual transformation. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded in Prashanti Nili in 2004. I was in college and I had decided uh, when I was in high school that men were a complete waste of time and I'm never going to get married, thank you very much. Glad you changed your mind. And no, I didn't. Oh. And I said, when I was in college, I said, well, God, if you really want me to get married, you have to give me the wisest man. Mm -hmm. And he did. About a couple of weeks later, he walked across my path. I never talked to him. And I said to my sister, see that man over there? I'm going to marry him. And, and was it love at first sight? Love at first sight. You didn't even say a word to him? I didn't even say a word to him. How'd you know? Just knew. This is way before Baba. Way before Baba. And obviously it turned out to be kind of okay. Yeah, 47 years. <laughs> wow. What's the, some of the one or two or three greatest lessons you've learned in 47 years of being with him? Just love. And as Jack mentioned earlier, Just Love is the title of a very important magazine article Louise wrote called Being Divine Love. Here are a few brief excerpts. All I ever wanted to do in this world was to love. I can see that now, but looking back, it wasn't always so clear. I felt different than other people and vaguely wondered, who is this person who feels and thinks so unlike almost everyone else? Who am I? And why am I on this planet? My mother planted in me the beginnings of a wonderful answer to those huge questions. She would say, remember to love everyone and everything, Wheezy, and always be happy. Grace is an ocean of divine energy accessible to all of us at all times. Our task is to tap into that sacred reservoir and bring grace into our lives. My little prayers are not desires for anything. They're love songs invoking my own truth, the divinity within me. Just love. Just love everything and everybody. Don't judge. There's nothing to judge. And do you need to have experiences of divinity to be no. with the divine? Just love. Loving, get, loving gets you there. And getting her there to love with certainty, Sai Baba. So, what do people do who go to see Sai Baba? For Louise and Jack, 
They're up at 3 a.m., meditate till 6, breakfast at 6.30. At 7, they walk to the Mandir, the temple for the first of Sai Baba's two daily visits. And then lunch at 11.30. They rest till 2, from 2 to 4, office hours for Jack and his writing and editing. At 4, back to the Mandir again to be with Sai Baba. And then dinner at 7 o'clock sometimes with guests. And finally, lights out at eight, a very full day. During Jack's working hours, he would write books, plan speaking trips abroad and at home, where Louise and he would talk and lead workshops on Sai Baba's teachings. And he would write special papers about Sai Baba's purpose in their lives. Excellent topics would be covered pointings and guidance to help others. And one topic that was always a favorite of mine, Swami Puts. We find ourselves in various places on the planet where he puts us. Mm -hmm. We live our life by two simple, sweet little words, Swami Puts. As if, as he places us here, he puts us there, he places us in other places. Are you one of those persons who believes that everything that happens to you, wherever you are, that's where you're supposed to be? Absolutely. I mean, really, uh, 108%. Uh, so how do you know where he wants you to be? It's, uh, it comes together, and that's the best way of saying it. If, uh, if we're supposed to go to South, South America, uh, and we, uh, then we get an invitation to go, and then things will come together. The money will come, the, uh, the time will come, especially uh, the opportunity will come, and everything happens so that we know that there's a hand in it that's larger than ours. And there's a hand in Jack's work as author. His books, filled with Sai Baba's personal guidance, have broken new ground, especially in the field of business and spirituality. People's consciousness is changing. When my book came out uh, in 1993... Which book was this? Uh, Dharmic Management. Okay. It was the first management book with spirit in the title. That's the first that I know of and the first that my publisher knows. Um, since then, there have been 75 or 80 published. Mm -hmm. So it is expanding. People aren't as spooked by the nomenclature nowadays. As an example of this, the one part of my book that's been reprinted the most was the part that I was worried about uh, people feeling uh, was too weird. And what did it say? That's the part about uh, uh, love in the workplace. Now, accounting associations have called me up and asked for permission to publish this. So that little part of the book. <laughs> So uh, surprising as uh, that does touch mm -hmm. some people, and people all know it, of course. And finally, now that we have had our lunch, Jack and I return to our conversation on this day regarding a few remaining issues, including a brief account of Jack's first observation in life as a philosopher and as a spiritual seeker at the age of four. There's a story from the four-year-old Jack Hawley, isn't there? There is. Will you tell it to us? Yes. Uh, I, I, and I think it was four years old. It might have been five. Okay. <laughs> but uh, four or five years old, and I was a little boy sitting by the sofa. And uh, the upstairs, people that lived upstairs in the apartment or the flat up there, uh, they came in, and I knew that the daughter, who was maybe 19 or 20, which to me is an old woman by that time, but uh, her daughter came in, and her boyfriend, she had just lost her boyfriend. And uh, my mother was telling us that about the daughter's boyfriend. So I had, a, had to think about it. Uh, I thought, well, Jack is here, me, because I had no idea of personal pronouns. And all I had is for myself, all I had was Jack. So Jack is here, uh, and Jack won't be here but Jack will come again and then I thought well maybe Jack was and now Jack is here so here's this little fellow uh, figuring out all these important big things of life and I uh, I uh, immediately after that because I was so happy that I'd figured that out that I forgot about it and it wasn't for 60 years until I remembered that incident of this little fellow Jack sitting by the sofa. Is it possible for philosophers to be four? <laughs> uh, 
Absolutely. And it's, just, <laughs> it's as a matter of fact, it's a, a direct experience of being a philosopher at four. And how much of an impact has Sai Baba had on this philosopher, Jack Hawley? You just might be surprised. Swami Sai Baba, his physical presence left us in the year 2011, though never his spiritual presence. I've asked you this question many times before, but this is now 2023. Should anybody care about this person who left his body that many years ago, a dozen years ago? Oh, that's a good question. My, my own personal answer is to care about it every day and almost every minute of every day. That's a whopper uh, of an answer. That's a, well, and also when you think of it, I mean, let's go to just uh, material things, which he wasn't a part of. I mean, he was a part of everything that was beyond material. But uh, go to his uh, universities, go to his thousands of, of grade schools, go to his uh, state-of-the-art uh, hospitals, go to his uh, finding ways to bring fresh, clean water to millions and millions of people in South India. So just those worldly things are worthwhile thinking about him a little bit. But when he turns into you being your guru, which he was my guru, and uh, one day, I love this story, he, he stopped my wife and I, and he, uh, he, with a big smile on his face, he says, higher vibrations now. We didn't know what that meant, but we know that somehow we had graduated from someplace and we're going someplace else. Uh, so yes, uh, she thought of him every day, as I, I think I mentioned before, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I do now. He's always in my mind. This Sri Satya Sai Baba, people need to have underscored that everything you enumerated is without charge for anybody. All of it's raised with the voluntary donations of followers from around the world. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah, who are never asked for a penny. Never, he there never are asks no for one, one dollar. As a matter of fact, uh, one of one of the uh, uh, one of the issues that I heard about when I was there is that the person that was doing the computer system for the for the main big hospital uh, said, "Okay, now today, uh, Swami, we have to uh, talk about." Uh, accounts receivables and he said what what is an account receivable <laughs> and he said uh, he said, well that's where all the money that's coming in to pay for the things uh will that's taken care of by computer and he said oh no no he said don't don't even worry about that there's no money going to be coming in you won't have to worry about it at all <laughs> he dismissed simple. this this high class uh very competent computer specialist from from new york he, uh, he just said, no, there's no, none of that here. And it was, it was something that the man could not quite gather. <laughs> <laughs> you have your book in front of you with some other notations that you are going to talk to me about, if it's okay. okay. Well, can, in fact, a couple of, I, I took a couple of buzzwords down. Um, I don't know if you can find them easily or not. You talked about one, higher vibrations. And then you also talked about be love and very happy, very oh, happy. Oh, very nice. The, one of the caregivers for Louise uh, came out and reported to me something very exciting for her. While and, she was sick here in the house. That's right, while, while she was taking care of Louise. Mm -hmm. And Louise, they all loved her, by the way. She said, Louise just said this to me. And she was so happy because Louise wasn't speaking very much. And she, and she was getting, sliding slowly downward. She said... She told me, uh, uh, very happy, very happy. And, uh, and and she even emphasized some of the words of the way Swami would emphasize them in, in his uh, English. Very happy, very happy. And she was so pleased with that. By the way, and I wanted to tell her, well, that's what Swami says. Oh, I did. I mentioned just quickly. Oh, that's what Swami says all the while to people. But uh, I did. I didn't make a big thing out of it. But she was so pleased with because that. normally she wouldn't be talkative at all. No, Louise. no, no. That's right. Yeah, we. So here's here's Louise coming through. I think really, if you look at it, it's a pointer, and the pointer is toward Jack, saying, "I am moving in the direction of, of uh, my uh, transition from this planet, this world, this life 
into a world beyond. So you're saying maybe in your opinion, that was yet another pointer or a reminder perhaps. You're 89, Jack, you're uh, turning 90. Why would you need another pointer? As if I didn't know. Yeah, well, uh, we always need other pointers. It's almost as if we live at the point of the pointers. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what I mean by that is this, that we, we, we may think along the way that sometimes or another that we're, we've graduated. And then the, the truth is, as a matter of fact, you asked me this one time question myself back in uh, 2020, Ted. You asked, and that was now three years ago. Mm -hmm. You asked me a question that brought this answer up is, you said, well, now that you've graduated, what, what are you going to do? And uh, the answer that I received inside was, there is more. And then you asked the question, well, how much more is there? And my very quick answer was uh, a thousand steps more or a thousand levels more. Yeah. So there's always learning. That, that goes back to the question that you just asked. It's, we're always learning. We're learning beyond more and more and more. School never shuts down. Never. That's right. School, there's, and there's, there's probably, there might be a graduation, but it's a physical graduation because we're there at one with that. There may be a graduation, but there's certainly no diploma. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's or, yet to come. Or if there is, nobody will ever see it. That's a thousand steps down the road. <laughs> that's right. A thousand steps down the road. Yeah. And then you find out that's or the door. Or maybe a thousand steps up the ladder. Up the ladder, yeah. <laughs> well, um, what I'd like you to do now, completely fresh in your mind, just to scan through. And if you don't see anything you want to comment on, don't. Well, and if you do. No, I think there's one that that you mentioned and I didn't answer, but I'd like to answer it again. Okay. Would well, that be the one has uh, be love? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, one of my, uh, uh, we have my, we had a flock of kids and they've all been here and they were here just last week. As a matter of fact, part of them here this week and now they've all gone. So, uh, but they were telling stories, remembering their mom. And one of the stories uh, was important for every one of them to hear. Uh, one of the sons uh, said, oh yes, I, when I was with mom, uh, no, I was walking away and I was halfway down the hall and uh, in the house here in our condo. Walking, and uh, she said, uh, she called out my name and I turned around and said, yes. And she said, be love. And he said, I'll never forget that. And that was the topic of our, the conversation of, the, of all of the siblings, all of the offspring uh, for the rest of our, for the rest of our time together, this particular time together. And when I heard that the first time, it reminded me of a phrase that Jody uses a lot that I've adopted now too, just be. And yes. you, you say how similar they are. Oh, well, not similar, they're the same thing. Yeah. Be, love, it's, or love, be. Or, it's all, be in that consciousness. And that consciousness is breathtaking. And even as I say it now, it just makes me breathe differently. Any hopes left? Any aspirations? Any desires? Um... few little, and they're very minor wants, uh, but they're, they're, and they're the part, the human part of it. Yeah. And uh, uh, for my grown-up children, there are some things that I still want for them, mm -hmm. uh, or want not for them. Uh, for example, I'd like to make sure that all of our trust and all of our paperwork for my transitioning is uh, done well enough so that doesn't put a little <laughs> burden on their shoulders. Yeah. So that's what I mean by uh, their minor wants. So next to nothing. That's right, next to nothing. Yeah. Yes. And lots of good memories. Uh, I think the best way I could uh, think about that or refer to it is that there's uh, not even any of that. There's, it's it's just a happiness. There's a a, a oneness. And I mean that very literally. There's a one. I, uh, 
I am that along with that. Uh, <laughs> Sai Baba talks over and over again about oneness with God and, uh, and, and little beams of light are shining through that for myself as they have already shined through for Louise. This is just wonderful. Uh, and Jack, I swear to God, <laughs> I never gave it a thought to bring a camera up here and to record this interview and to impose <laughs> upon you at the age of 90 to sit still for this long period of time. <laughs> it happened as I was driving up the highway from Coronado, I said to myself, but you have a camera, it's on your telephone. <laughs> <laughs> And you agreed, and I'm so grateful you did. This will be cherished by those who love and know you, and I suspect ditto for those who are just coming to know you for I the first time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank and you. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. <laughs> Sairam. J.J. Sairam.